Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Kebab and Curry Seminar. <laughs> it's such a wonderful enticement. I'm really impressed by those of you who are not eating the Kebab and Curry, because that means you actually wanted to be here, which is great, so thanks. That's lovely. As you know, I'm Mark Blythe, and I run the Rhodes Centre for International Economics and Finance. And uh, today I'm very happy to... Oh, can you pass the book? Thank you. Very happy to have Linda Yu here on part of a whirlwind tour of the northeast of the United States. You're going to New York today, later NYU. today, NYU, to do a talk, and then you're basically back over the pond, right? So, coming through town. Um, what to say about uh, Linda? She has um, had an incredibly varied career. She is an economist. She uh, currently has a position at Oxford. She also is an affiliate at Chatham House. She worked with Bloomberg at one point. She was a BBC China correspondent for a few years. And uh, she's also an author. So basically a Renaissance person in that regard, which is great. Now, why this book? Why did I decide to bring her here? Because quite honestly, this is one of the books that I wish I'd wrote. Right? So I've been saying for the longest time, a little thing that sticks in my head, is what would Mrs. Thatcher have thought of the financial crisis? Uh, those sort of counterfactuals, right? So I suspect that she would have been furious because the whole point of banks in her worldview was that they were meant to fund industry. They weren't meant to lever up asset strip industry and destroy half the British economy. So counterfactually, I think she would have been rather annoyed by what happened. And uh, what Linda has done in this book, What Would the Great Economist Do?, is essentially to ask a whole series of counterfactuals about very important thinkers, give you a succinct summary of what they are, what the, what, the, what the core of their thought is, their lives and times, that sort of thing, position them, and then address a contemporary issue. So David Ricardo, as I'm sure you all know, international trade theorist, would he worry about bilateral deficits in the way that Donald Trump does? Milton Friedman, famous for money. I wonder what he would have thought of all that central bank activism. We've suddenly become aware of inequality in the world and the problem of wage stagnation. Well, somebody who knew about that from the 1940s onwards was Joan Robinson. So she took all of these classical, neoclassical and contemporary thinkers and essentially said, right, OK, so what do we care about? What are the insights from those thinkers? Asking that kind of really nice counterfactual. I recommend it to everybody, not just to academics. The great thing about this, this is really a book that I wish I'd wrote because it will sell a lot. That is to say, I think the best use for this for those Americans amongst you is the following, particularly the younger ones. You probably have a really annoying uncle who thinks he understands economics. Like everybody kind of has one of those in the family. And you dread going home at Thanksgiving because he's going to bang on about whatever it is. Give him this book. Because it's not just your one pet economist, it's all of them. And you actually learn more from engaging all of them than just the one that happens to fit your particular prejudices. So with that, I'll leave it to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. That's such a kind introduction. Uh, when Mark invited me to come, I jumped at the opportunity. Um, he's brilliant. He's funny. And, uh, and I certainly um, think it's a real privilege to be here uh, at this wonderful university and this terrific institute and have a chance to talk about um, this book that I've really enjoyed writing. Not so much the uh, copy editing part, but certainly the writing <laughs> and, uh, and talking about it. And I also want to thank Hayden, the lovely staff who've um, really made this trip so easy um, and enjoyable for me. So, um, so Mark um, has suggested that I speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll, we'll um, open it up for questions. So what I really like to do in this time is just to um, give you an, a sort of an, a big picture um, about um, the great economists and economic history over 250 years, <laughs> which I will go through. Uh, you know, about 15 minutes or so, and then, uh, and then I focus on a couple of the contemporary issues that Mark mentions that I cover in the book, um, just to get a discussion going, and then I look forward to having a conversation um, with all of you about it. So the, um, the first thing about the great economists, and really I think what, um, I don't think I fully appreciated until I actually started looking at 250 years of economic history, is how much ideas matter. Um, how much ideas contribute to the big questions and debates of the day. And so 
Um, one of the traits of the great economists that I look at in this book, and I focus on macro um, uh, economics, generally growth, development, how the system is organized, um, so I don't do micro in this book. Um, it strikes me that economics today has become very narrow and very uh, can be very technical, uh, whereas the greatest economists use an analytical tools, which is what you gain from economics, to contribute to the big debates of the day. And so the fact that these their ideas have changed, actually changed our society, I just think it's worth spending a moment to reflect on in terms of um, why it is um, the great economists were great. It's because they engaged, even if the answers uh, were not simple or completely um, open to modeling, um, but they contributed. And these are some of the ideas that have changed the world. So the first thing to say is, you'll recall when the Corn Laws were repealed in 1846. I know Mark um, I knows this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, it may not be top, you know, tip of the memory for a lot of people, but um, the Corn Laws in 1846 were actually momentous um, legislation that was repealed. It was a protectionist piece of agricultural legislation, corn referred to all grains, and this is in Britain. And so for years and years before that, uh, mercantilism ruled the day. So mercantilism um, is this idea that countries should run trade surpluses, and even better, if you go and you discover some gold and silver and bring it back, that's even uh, even better for the surplus. But the ideas of David Ricardo and other classical economists who pushed back against this idea and instead embraced opening up and the idea of comparative advantage so that you should focus on making your economy more efficient, specialization and exchange. That really changed the debate and it meant that we had a period of globalization that accompanied the improvement in standard of living in the latter part of the 19th century. So this is really when the Industrial Revolution began to spread from Britain to Germany to the United States and elsewhere. A second idea that changed uh, the way in which we live was the emergence of the welfare state after World War II. So in the, um, under the Industrial Revolution, the capitalist system didn't include the welfare state as we know it today, whether Social Security in this country or um, the NHS um, in Britain. So that came about because there was a fierce ideological debate at the time between capitalism, whether the system should survive, and it was heavily under challenge by communist and socialist regimes in the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. So the catalyst for this was the Long Depression or the Great Depression of the 19th century. The Panic of 1873, which is when U.S. banking uh, system, the financial system crashed and had reverberations across uh, across the world, it sounds a little familiar. That's when unemployment appeared for the first time in the dictionary, and that led to a um, interest in Marxism, the beginning of the trade union movement, and this was really when you had a split in terms of what economic system would work best. So, at one point in the early part of the 20th century, 60% of the world <coughs> lived in either communist or socialist regimes. And the battle of ideas that happened was that neoclassical economists um, revised the capitalist system and people like Alfred Marshall um, in Britain, they started to accept much more of a redistributive element in the fiscal system. So the welfare state capitalism that emerged after World War II um, was a reaction to the uh, the disagreements over um, whether capitalism should remain or whether the world should move towards these communist and socialist countries. Now, um, of course, this battle wasn't really won probably until the um, the end of the Berlin uh, Wall, uh, the end of the Cold War, communist uh, countries in the former Soviet Union uh, embracing uh, market-based economies, and that didn't happen until the end of the 1980s. So. Then you had a small period, I think, where it seemed there was agreement over the best economic system. But as we know today, that's, that agreement has, again, disintegrated. We have a, again, um, a lack, a loss of consensus about the best way to organize the economy. 
But these ideas of economists um, contributed to shaping those debates. So these were not economic movements uh, primarily, especially when I'm talking about communism, socialism. Obviously, there's a lot of other um, elements to it, but economists play their part. And the reason I'm stressing this is because the great economists tended to work across disciplines. So they also tended to look at other subjects, uh, philosophy, politics, history, and embrace those. And I think that's why um, their ideas had such suasion um, and really changed the way in which we live. So the great economists that I write about in this book, and every chapter is organized around the ideas of a great economist and how it's relevant to one of our current issues. And I would say um, you can't really look at someone's ideas without understanding the person and the times in which they live. So every chapter is a part of biography and then um, a seminal model, whether it's trade or government spending uh, or monetary policy, and then the data around the current issue and how the theories has, have evolved. So these are the people that I choose. Now, this is a very imperfect um, plotting of uh, where people sit, obviously. It's all, but I think it's just helpful to have a general picture about the debates, especially in terms of their disagreements. So on the kind of market end, um, I've put Adam Smith, uh, David Ricardo, his disciple, uh, in the classical uh, economic sense. And they're there because um, Adam Smith actually never used the word capitalism. That word wasn't used until it was actually first used in a novel by the author of Vanity Fair, and it was an antonym for Marxism. Um, so Adam Smith did actually believe in institutions um, to support the economy. He wasn't like the very free market people I've got on the further end, people like Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman. Um, and then below him, I've got the neoclassical economists, which are Irving Fisher, Alfred Marshall, uh, Robert Solow. Now, I mentioned there the debate with Marx. So Karl Marx, I've got over the other side, where he believed in uh, a centrally planned economy, a communist system. Um, and then in between, I've got people like John Maynard Keynes, who obviously introduced this concept that state intervention was necessary um, in order for an economy to realize its full employment potential. And it's actually a stronger, the general theory is actually a stronger statement than just to address the Great Depression. So Keynesianism moved the um, uh, economic um, debate further towards having a role for the state. Now, Joan Robinson, I've placed roughly underneath him, but slightly towards the state side, because she was a disciple of John Maynard Keynes. Um, in fact, she was one of the five people entrusted to review the general theory at Cambridge. Um, she was also married to one of the other members of the inner circle. She was having an affair with yet another. So I'd like to think she had a casting vote on the general theory. <laughs> um, but later on in her career, she disavowed Keynesianism, and she began to become an admirer of communist regimes. So I've sort of shifted her slightly over. And then just very quickly, a couple of other people there. Douglas North, who uh, many of you will know, father of new institutional economics. He looked around and said, oh my god, all of you economists have got, got it wrong. <laughs> this is <laughs> why countries fail and why countries are rich. It goes much further beyond capital labor and uh, technology. Um, you're missing institutions, history, culture. Um, path dependence um, and all of that. So I sort of placed him roughly there just to give an indication of the importance of the role of the state. Not that he believed the state should dictate things, but understanding where the institutions of the state sit. Um, and then finally, Joseph Schumpeter. I've placed him sort of in the market area because Schumpeter um, was an Austrian economist who is best known for coming up with the theory of creative destruction. Um, but he wasn't actually. Um, best known for that. He's best known for that now. Um, but at the time, his best known book was probably his book published in 1942, um, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. And in it, he argued that because this is the time when this battle of ideas was really raging, and he argued that um, capitalism would lay the seeds of its own demise um, because you end up with um, the capitalist system becoming um, economically successful but politically unacceptable. And so he, and he thought socialism would be um, what came about. 
Um, so they, as I said, contributed to the big debates. It wasn't just the theory of comparative advantage. It was everything else that um, they were also part of. So I'm just going to introduce a little bit about uh, some of the great economists, and then, as I say, I'll move to um, the issues, um, a couple of the issues. So the first thing is obviously Adam Smith. I've got his um, dates up there. The father of economics, the father of classical economics. Um, his invisible hand theory is very well known and obviously still the premise of uh, modern economics. Um, but the one thing I will point out is that um, he timed the publication of his seminal work, The Wealth of Nations, to come out in 1776 because like all of the great economists that I write about, he wanted to be influential. He was trying to influence America's war of independence and he wrote in The Wealth of Nations that Britain should resign itself to the mediocrity of its position, stop fighting an expensive and ruinous war, and just accept trade with the, colon, the former colonists, regardless of whether they're colonists or not. Um, oh, and um, like the other great economists I write about, he was really hard on himself. He was very disappointed in his life's work, and he was so unhappy with what he produced later on um, that he actually asked for all of his manuscripts to be burned after his death. Um, that's a recurring theme in The Great Economist that I write about. Joseph Schumpeter, uh, Friedrich Hayek is another one. Um, the, uh, they literally would grade themselves in their productivity and come out at 50% every week. They just didn't feel they were doing quite enough. Um, David Ricardo, um, it's worth mentioning because obviously trade is a big current issue, so this is the second chapter. He's the father of international trade. Um, he's, as I mentioned, he's a disciple of Adam Smith, but sort of roughly so, because he obviously, if you look at the dates I've got up there, um, he never met Adam Smith. David Ricardo um, actually didn't study economics at all. Um, he was a stockbroker. Um, he um, made his fortune um, betting the right way on the Battle of Waterloo. And then I suppose um, when you become rich, you become bored. And that's what happened to him. He was bored in his 30s. He was on holidays, on vacation, um, and happened to pick up a copy of The Wealth of Nations, taught himself economics, and wrote <laughs> the model of international trade with comparative advantage. He also came up with the concept of rent seeking, which is something that's very familiar that we currently use. Ricardian equivalence, if you think about the impact of a tax change on consumption behavior, all of that came from a guy who never studied economics at all. This is not a comment for the students in the room about the value <laughs> of your education. <laughs> um, and so, but as I said, he was instrumental in changing one of the big debates of the time. And I think that's a debate that we're still currently having, which is do um, trade deficits matter? And then um, I want to stress for a moment Karl Marx, because I think it's always been the case that economics has um, division and argument over whose ideas are most persuasive, most um, applicable, and that's absolutely how we should be. Um, and I suppose one of the things I learned from reading so much about the great economists while I was writing this book is that they believed you should fiercely, fiercely argue your points, but the arguments are not personal, they're not ad hominem. Sure, they'll lobby, they'll lobby an insult here and there, um, but the idea isn't to have um, anything uh, that goes beyond that. Um, so I want to, I want to uh, talk for a moment about Karl Marx, and then I want to show you one of the fierce debates um, that um, economists, great economists, have been having. So the reason I mention Karl Marx is obviously he very much rejected the um, classical economist approach to the organization, the economic system. He wrote the Communist Manifesto with uh, Friedrich Engels, who was his longtime collaborator. Um, Engels actually supported uh, Marx and his family for um, all of Marx's life, uh, Karl Marx's life, and also the livelihood of Marx's daughter um, and her family. Um, he's like one of those co-authors that never gets any credit, <laughs> so I always feel obliged to mention him. <laughs> um, so Marx saw exactly the same Industrial Revolution and saw what was happening in the capitalist system. And he essentially believed that the exploitation of workers in such a system would inevitably lead to 
an uprising. It would lead to revolution. And he was convinced the Panic of 1873 was the trigger um, because the Long Depression, the Great Depression of the 19th century, showed um, the inadequacy of the current economic system. Um, and then, like all good economists, um, when uh, it didn't result in a communist revolution, uh, his theory was wrong, so he changed his theory. So then he then decided that uh, it wasn't going to be economic crisis that led to a revolution. It was going to be in, um, income inequality, because this is now the beginning of the Gilded Age. And he became convinced that it was inequality that was going to trigger revolution and lead us to communism. So Karl Marx was disappointed um, because he never saw the communist revolutions um, that came about um, that was after his death. He never saw the uh, what I described earlier about his ideology um, taking hold in vast swathes of the world. Um, and in fact, um, one of the best quotes from Marx is about his constant disappointment. Um, so he he believed that the French Revolution um, was going to be the real change to lead to the kind of worker representation that he was he had always been hoping for. And uh, when uh, Napoleon Bonaparte disappointed him, made himself emperor, and then his <coughs> nephew uh, did exactly the same thing um, several years later, the best known quote from Marx is probably this one. History repeats itself. The first time is tragedy. The second time is farce. Oh, and by the way, his family was always very, very disappointed in him, too, because um, Marx's uh, wife um, signed her letters, Baroness von Westphalen. She comes from an aristocratic Prussian family, and they were all very embarrassed to have a revolutionary for a brother. But I hope I've given you sort of the spectrum of the disagreements there. And um, I want to just show you one, um, one uh, example of the rivalries that I'm describing and why these rivalries in terms of um, the ideas that still um, would try to, um, this idea, this battle of ideas is still with us today. So how many of you have seen Hamilton? It's a great, uh, great musical. It's, it's fabulous. So, you know, the, uh, the rap battle where they're arguing um, the case in the cabinet. So those of you who haven't seen it, there's a fantastic scene where they have a rap battle between, uh, in the, within the cabinet where Alexander Hamilton is arguing against um, uh, uh, the other cabinet members. And this is like, um, this is like Hamilton. Two rappers pretend to be um, John Maynard Keynes and Friedrich Hayek. And they are wrapping their um, arguments over who was right about the calls of the Great Depression. It has over six and a half million views on YouTube. So uh, they did another version about the Great Recession, which is um, fight of the century. So if you have a chance to, uh, to look at it, um, I think it just kind of encapsulates what I was describing in terms of we should never expect um, one dominant um, economic idea. It's always a battle and disagreement in about assessing uh, which ones really explain um, our economic challenges. Which then leads me to our economic challenges. As I said, I want to spend um, a few moments on a couple of these challenges. Um, so I'm going to do a very unscientific thing, which is just to sort of have you um, raise your hand and indicate interest, and then I'll pick um, that way. Otherwise, we've got a, we've got a lot of challenges. So. Um, you, can mo you can vote multiple times. This is not the Oscars. It's not a transferable <laughs> vote. Um, so anyone interested in should government rebalance the economy? Um, okay. Do trade deficits matter? Okay. Can China become rich? Okay. Um, is inequality inevitable? Oh, yeah, that's one so far. Yeah. Are we at risk of repeating the 1930s? <laughs> okay. To invest or not invest? We've got a lot of challenges. <laughs> uh, what drives? There's no good slide. <laughs> what drives innovation? Okay. What can we learn from financial crises? Okay. Why are wages so low? Okay. Are central banks doing too much? Okay. Why are so few countries rich? Oh, actually, there's quite a lot for that. Um, do we face a slow growth future? And is globalization trouble? Ooh, what do you think, Mark? I think China's definitely one. Yeah. And then inequality. 
Why well, if you so few countries are rich? Okay. So let's spend a couple of moments on those, and then I can in, open it up in terms of discussing these issues. So um, I think, can China grow rich? So this is uh, GDP per capita adjusted for PPP, <coughs> purchasing power parity, what a dollar buys in, um, in China and in emerging economies. So these are the IMF forecasts that go out to 2022. And what you see is that really in the last decade, average incomes in China have begun to really pull away from the average for emerging economies. But the gap between China and advanced economies is considerable. And we are in, I think, a very unusual place because the world's second biggest economy, 60 percent of U.S. GDP, may well become the biggest economy. But if you look at average incomes, that's actually what matters in terms of people's standards of living. And so it's very unusual to have such a large economy, which is actually a middle-income country, which could be subject to what's known as the middle-income country trap. So most countries in this world are not rich. I'm sure I'll come to that when I do the why are so few countries rich. Only a quarter of the world's countries are rich, high income. Only 13 countries have become um, high income since 1960. There were 101 middle income countries then. And by 2008, only 13 had become prosperous, and none which are the size of China. There's no magic formula in terms of becoming rich. If we knew that, um, that would be um, uh, that would be a bestseller, Mark. <laughs> um, but there are two things I think for China, which I've written quite a lot about. I've written um, a trilogy of books on China, um, and I think the two things that I've sort of taken away are that. For China to become rich, they will have to innovate. That is a pretty well understood thing. So I've looked at a lot at Chinese industries. Are they innovative? That's a really hard thing to assess. Um, we know about uh, Huawei, which is now in the news a lot, <laughs> um, the world's biggest telecoms equipment company. So if you go to a meeting at Huawei now, um, if I'm speaking in English um, on the monitor, um, they'll have a simultaneous Chinese translation. So they're working on a simultaneous translator competing with the likes of uh, Google and Silicon Valley um, to do it. And by the way, the, um, do you know the hardest things to translate in any language? It's actually jokes. So they are working on this kind of AI, which is if I said in English, why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? In Chinese, it gets translated as how do you put an elephant into the refrigerator? You open the door and you put it in. <laughs> so apparently the gold standard of cutting edge technology is crap jokes. If you can translate that into any language, you're there. <laughs> um, but the problem, the challenge for China is it's innovating during a time when, for the most part, TFP is declining across advanced economies. So there is a Bank of England study that shows that as smartphone penetration goes like this, our productivity goes like this. <laughs> so <laughs> they are actually trying to innovate at a time when economy-wide TFP is actually declining. And the digital era hasn't produced the same. So my, what I often say is, will this, or what we come up with now, uh, be as good as electrification? And in many ways, that is a challenge for China. They're very big in the digital space, um, but are these technologies going to enable them to be able to catch up? The other thing is institutions. So China's done a lot in terms of legal institutional reform. So um, I have uh, a background in law as well, and I've written a book on looking at China's institutions. Um, but at some point, um, are they sufficient as market supporting institutions to get to enable a country to become rich without the accompanying political reform. So when the rule of law goes up against the rule of party, um, is that going to be a point in which the informal institutions that have enabled China's development begin to hit an impasse? And I think those are the two areas that really matter in terms of thinking about China. I mean, in other, uh, you know, other ways, their growth is remarkable. Um, China, according to the World Bank, um, it has eradicated extreme poverty, um, hundreds of millions of people in the middle class. Um, that, those are the markers, I think, that really matter. 
So, you know, when I go to uh, New York and I go shopping or um, I go to a fancy place, I get great service until they work out I'm not actually Chinese. <laughs> so when we say it's average across China, their average incomes, obviously urban areas, they're already very rich. So if you're watching the Oscars last night, Crazy Rich Asians, the second book in that series is actually called China Rich Girlfriend. That's why you should be after, China Rich Girlfriend. <laughs> um, okay, and then um, do we say we'll look at, um, why are so few countries rich or inequality? Inequality. inequality. Okay, so inequality and then I'll open it up. So um, in terms of inequality, is it inevitable? So this is the Gini coefficient between the United States and Canada. So the Gini coefficient is a measure of absolute income differences. So if the Gini coefficient is one, it means that one person has all the income in the country. If it's zero, it means everyone has an equal amount. So I've put Canada on there because in terms of the Gini coefficient, the levels of inequality in Canada are very similar to that of Europe. But in terms of all of the culture, institutions, Canadians are very similar to Americans. Um, in fact, it's hard to tell if someone is Canadian. Apologies to the Canadians here. <laughs> um, you know, but the reason, but yet the difference in terms of inequality is down to, and this is, I think, pretty, um, uh, pretty apparent, um, it's about political decisions over redistribution. So is inequality inevitable in a capitalist system? Arguably, yes, um, with differential returns to factors. And inequality, generally speaking, has been rising alongside ex increasing market development. Again, you see that in China and emerging economies. The more market-driven they become, income inequality increases. So we're, see we're seeing that in the data. But why do some countries have higher levels of inequality and other countries have lower levels? Well, a lot of it is the willingness to embrace redistributive systems. So in this chapter, I write about the ideas of Alfred Marshall. When they were first, the neoclassical economists were first looking at the rise of inequality, the Gilded Age, led to the roaring 20s, the dissatisfaction that inequality was bringing, and saying that this could actually be the demise of the capitalist system. And that really led to an acceptance by neoclassical economists that having a redistributive system did not disincentivize work to the extent that you ought not do it. And their mentality was very much what you would, might describe as late Victorian in Britain, because that was the period in which they thought hard about the deserving poor. So this history has, goes back a century. And today, income inequality in America is so high, it's known as the Second Gilded Age. And so it's actually higher than it was in the um, First Gilded Age. So is there a political discussion to be had about it, levels of income inequality um, and the amount of redistribution um, that would be politically acceptable and economically feasible? So I think that's the, um, that's the kind of, the, and I give a lot of historical um, examples as well as policies you might want to think about in terms of how you redistribute, um, because that's obviously a big debate. So I want to uh, move to questions. I just want to end with one quote. Well, two quotes, because um, you're an academic audience, so um, I think this first quote might be of interest. So Robert Solow, who's the only economist who's alive that I write about in this book, <laughs> um, there are, um, he said, um, if you want to solve our economic problems, don't admit qualifications. Never claim more than you can justify. An economist trying to talk to the general public gained respect by insisting on the qualifications, by not appearing as a pundit, as someone who knows all the answers. Um, and then my favorite quote, which is the best reason to know economics, is from Joan Robinson. She said, the purpose of studying economics is not to acquire a set of ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So today we have to end sharply at one. That gives us 20 minutes. So who wants to begin the conversation? Don't all jump at once. Thanks, Dan. So um, when we were getting our food, <coughs> Hold on. I'm going to take this. Yeah. Well. So I'm Dan Smith. I'm an anthropologist. Um, so when we were getting our food, I joked with Mark about whether or not any of these great economists would get tenure in, or, te or get a tenure-track job in today's
<laughs> American economics departments. And I was just kind of joking, but it actually, I mean, it, it, it's related to a serious question, which is about the role of academic e economics in the kinds of things that you're talking about now, where at least here at Brown, you know, it's dominated by econometrics and things like that. I have no idea I could take a poll how many tenure or tenure track economy, economics professors are in the room right now. How many PhD economics students are in the room right now? So two or three. No, so quite it's, a lot in the front, uh, uh, the whole front <laughs> row. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of PhD students, so about eight PhD students, not a single professor mm -hmm. for a talk widely advertised at Brown that says, what would the great economists have to say about today's problems? Mm -hmm. I just find it, I would just wonder if you could comment on that. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I think, so Douglas North that I mentioned briefly, um, he was very much against the dominant economic thinking because as I said, he kind of threw out the neoclassical growth models, the solo models. He just didn't think that economists could explain what was actually happening on the ground. So North essentially never had an appointment at a place as prestigious as Brown. He was always in lesser ranked universities until he won the Nobel Prize in 1993 and then, uh, <laughs> then he got all sorts of visiting professorships. So it is, it is challenging because economics over the last, um, well actually since Irving Fisher, so over the last century, has moved to be more technical and um, more uh, niche almost because there's so much and people tend to focus on something quite narrow. And because that becomes the dominant paradigm in terms of success, it's actually hard for someone as brilliant as Douglas North and in institutional economics um, to, um, and that's what essentially books like this are about. It's about history, institutions. It's about things which are not um, a seminar on, you know, econometrics. Um, my previous book, um, China's Growth, which is uh, an academic book, at about page 60, it's all econometrics. So Oxford University Press advertised it as a trade book. Every time I give a talk, I'm like, so if you read up to page 60, you're okay. <laughs> Um, and so I think there is, you know, so I think, but I think because of the 2008 crisis, I think economics is looking again at bigger picture issues. So the key is, can you produce very compelling analytical models and then use that as a basis to contribute to the big debates? And that's essentially what the great economists did. So people like Irving Fisher that I mentioned, his best known theories are actually around consumption theory. He changed the quantity theory of money, this idea that was later um, developed by the monetarists about money and inflation. He actually took, he's very seminal in those theories, but he used it to contribute to the big debate. So you have the tools and then you contribute in that way. So the question I always think is, is there an incentive to contribute to the big debates in academia today? By the way, most of you will never have heard of Irving Fisher, except the Fisher equation, because um, Irving Fisher actually moved economics from Britain to America. He started the American uh, economics neoclassical tradition um, because he introduced mathematics um, and Americans were at the forefront of this. But the reason you have never heard of him is because in 1929 he predicted the stock market was at a permanently high plateau. <laughs> and then he spent the 1930s predicting a quick turnaround of the U.S. economy. Um, he lost his uh, fortune because he also uh, he was actually um, a brilliant economist, and he uh, was a businessman. Like most of these great economists, they didn't do just one thing. So he actually invented the Rolodex. So, okay, so for those of you who um, What's a Rolodex? were born <laughs> after 1985, uh, a Rolodex um, is like an index card where they, he cut notches in the index card. So you could easily roll it on a Rolodex so you could find contacts easily. Okay, just nod. And uh, so he actually made a fortune doing this. Um, but his problem was that he was a Yale professor. His problem was that he married rich 
So his wife was very wealthy, and her money enabled them to have this massively fantastic lifestyle in New Haven. And he always felt he needed to make money, more money. The only way to do it is just throw it in the stock market. So he borrowed on margin, invested in the stock market in the 1920s. So when he predicted the stock market was on a permanently high plateau, it crashed. He lost his reputation, lost his fortune. He was indebted to his sister-in-law um, for his entire life uh, until she died. Um, and then he couldn't afford to live in his house in New Haven because she wasn't supporting them anymore. So Yale bought the house, let them live in it if they paid rent. And then he couldn't afford the rent. Yale kicked him out. And then he spent his last days in a small apartment with his wife. And then his wife died. And then he died. But it's okay because he's a great economist and his ideas live on. <laughs> Before we move on to questions, we have a whole bunch of PhD economists here, right? So the, the general proposition is there's renewed interest in all these big old ideas, but you have the professional incentives that you face. You've come to this talk. Why? <laughs> what, are you, what, what are you trying to do? What is it? You're how do you relate to this conversation? Just Go, pass on, on the mic. Go on. <laughs> Go on. So well, I guess mic. that. Uh, as as you were saying, it's it's, uh, it's also sometimes good to have like a different uh, taking a different perspective. Uh, we have a bit broader uh, out of all the technicalities that we're every day like lost into. And I think yeah, especially when you have to try to answer these kind of questions, it's like very important questions related to inequality or these issues uh, affecting our society right now. It's uh, as I was saying, important sometimes to abstract a bit and like think about it a bit more uh, organically uh, because it's very easy, especially right now, uh, yeah, as I was saying, to get lost into details and losing like the, the overall uh, perspective. So I think this is very important also to remind us uh, both have to listen and uh, yeah, take a broader perspective. Thank you. There's hope for the future. <laughs> Mic up to Tony at the back there. Uh, Hold on, to I got one. Really. So the, f the first question is, is there a great Chinese economist who mm. we haven't heard about yet, uh, which comes to the sort of second question in, in your explanation of the, the, the Chinese story sort of suggests that it's, a, it's part of the, the success is related to their informal institutions mm. and not their formal ones, w which um, I'm just wondering whether you want to elaborate on sure. and uh, I mean, in relationship perhaps to have we seen a great Chinese economist yet? Yeah, great questions. Um, so <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the great things about writing this book where everyone is dead except for Robert Solo <laughs> is that I don't have to choose among contemporary greats. Um, otherwise, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so there are, I think, um, increasingly Chinese economists who are doing really very interesting work. I think one of the challenges um, today is the seminal models that I cover are seminal models that have been there for 200 years. So it's a kind of a lot of work today, not all, but a lot of work done in China is focused on economic development, which modifies these models. So there are fewer Chinese economists. I mean, well, I should say it's one of the, uh, the real strengths of, um, that, of China, that it's um, highly educated um, uh, you know, students return. And they're very fo a lot of Chinese economists are very focused on China's development question. I don't meet many people who are um, necessarily working uh, you know, sort of in theories for theory's sake. They tend to be very involved. And I think it's because China is facing such challenges, and it has been for decades. So I think there will be a great Chinese economist in a future volume of this book. Um, and in terms of China's informal institutions, one of the most active areas of research is trying to work out the China paradox. So how is it possible that the world's really, and um, there's only three countries in the world that have grown continuously for more than 30 years, which is actually one of the keys to becoming prosperous. Um, so the economies are South Korea and Taiwan, and China is the only the third one, in which case continuous growth 
is normally what you need to become prosperous. And yet, actually, very few countries have achieved it over the last few decades. But how did it do it with such poor institutions? That's the China paradox, China as an outlier. So on all of the measures of market-supporting institutions, China ranks badly. So how do you measure institutions, I think, is one of the issues. So our institutions, and this is very, very much along the lines of Douglas North, they're much more informal than probably we, most people would immediately think of. So as I say, my background's also in law. There's a feeling that if you simply took what's de jure, the legal regulatory system, China would be such an outlier, um, it would be inexplicable, really. But if you go to China, de facto, there is a belief in the institutions. And so the security of property rights, the security of transactions, a lot of it is based around social networks. A lot of it is based on expectations. The system in China wouldn't suit a foreign company because they would be viewed as insecure. But to a Chinese company, the incremental improvements in intellectual property rights and contracting rights and private <coughs> property protection is something that um, has enabled transactions to take place. But one of the arguments that I make is, at what point does that hit a limit? And you do actually need better legal formal protections, because this happened in Britain at the turn of the last century. It's fine to have um, relational contracting, which is very informal up to a point. But then um, in Britain, um, just over a century ago, because of the development of the stock market, there was a lot more arm's length transactions which are not well supported by um, informal institutions based around trust. So, you know, most of you will know the studies of Abner Grief um, around Middle Eastern traders. So I'll give you my, my Chinese example. So in China, you might wonder, how do you do a deal when uh, legal systems are so poor, um, you know, you don't trust the judicial system? Um, well, basically, so say I vest um, in Mark's company, and Mark runs off with my money, my mother will call Mark's mother and say, Mark's run off with Linda's money. Um, and now you're ostracized from the village banquet, and you'll never be invited to anything else. It's that kind of social capital interaction. But as I say, at one point, it becomes so large, arm's length, and that's where I think China's beginning to head. Um, but they are improving their thing, IPR protections and, and what have you at the moment. But as I say, the main problem is the rule of law against the rule of party when the rule of law is not an independent judiciary. So China has 200,000 judges, most of whom have no legal education, um, and they can't attract lawyers because unlike here, where it's prestigious to clerk and to do these things, in, a, in China, if you're a good lawyer, you're going to get snapped up by a private firm. So it's probably going to take a generation or so before the legal system really improves. And yet China's, Chinese businesses still plowing on. I mean, that's the China mm -hmm. paradox. Seth, at the front here. Just down here. Green shirt. Hi, thanks for coming to speak with us today. So I'm a historian, and I do tend to think with Douglas North that there aren't markets that aren't, that don't, markets inherently exist embedded within law and culture. That's totally part of my historical sensibility. Mm. But the other part of my historical sensibility makes me very skeptical about the greatness of the great economists you described today mm. and the value of reproducing this dialogue as the great conversation. Mm. As a historian, right, I'm thinking about things like slavery, about mm. imperial resource extraction and colonialism, about the half of the world's population who's female and reproductive labor that can't be quantified and thus is generally excluded from the way in which economists calculate work, value, et cetera, mm. et cetera. I worry that by basically allowing people who don't see the world as existing in such a way that white supremacy matters, that colonialism matters, that women matter, but by giving them the privileged position that you give them, we simply follow them down a path that has gotten us into this mess rather than finding a way out of this mess. And I'm wondering if there's a way in which you want to think about the lack of the diversity of your economists or the way in which those blind spots that they've provided or that they have could be in some way leveraged to do something productive rather than simply continue to exist in a world in which we pretend that market actors are simply disembodied entities rather than people who move through the world with race, with gender, with difference, et cetera. 
Yeah, so um, so I kind of care about diversity. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, I should I should have made clear that every chapter, it's a great economist who came up with the seminal model, and then the way in which the ideas have changed. That's how I bring it to the present day. So there's a wider spectrum. But it's also historically the case, and I'm not here to defend history, literally, this is historically the case, that I bring their ideas to the present because I'm actually explaining seminal models in economics in an accessible way. And the great economists who came up with them, they were, economics is, um, was founded in Britain. It is very, uh, yeah. not just um, uh, white, it's also very male dominated. And women couldn't actually take degrees in economics um, until the early part of the 20th century. And so, you know, but the, um, the models that we use and the way they've changed is, the, um, is what I talk about in the book, in every chapter. Um, and, you know, I think in the future, there will be Chinese and I'm sure um, Indian and other great economists um, who would be um, those um, in the uh, in a book like this. I think there's just two more. Gentleman over there. Oh, no. I remember as an undergraduate being incredibly fond of Robert Heilbronner's The Worldly Philosophers. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if you could kind of place your volume into context, mm -hmm. you, know, what, you know, compare and contrast, where, where, where do you, where, where's, how is your approach different? Yeah, so um, in many ways this is almost an update to that classic. So he roughly stops um, much earlier, because obviously the later editions of this book kind of updated a bit. but. Um, he doesn't really go much into latter 20th century ideas. And it was very much, uh, but such an enjoyable book, and really does view the history of economic thought um, in terms of, yeah, philosophers, in terms of the big ideas. So my book is very similar in that approach, in that it's accessible. So, um, but my book also focuses those ideas on helping people think through solutions to current problems. Um, but yeah, no, I'm a big fan of that book. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yep. I, I very much enjoyed your talk. Thank you for, for, for coming. Um, it struck me as you were going through your list of you know, sort of current big questions, and you know, particularly the you know, can China become rich question, mm -hmm. and then I was kind of looking on the list for other things that I think of as big questions, admittedly not necessarily mm -hmm. economic questions, but big kind of political questions of the day, including things like population displacement and mi migration, mm. um, and, and also ethno-nationalism. And it struck me that one of the economists who I remember learning about in economic history that was absent from your list is Malthus. Oh, and yeah. I'm wondering mm -hmm. where you would place Malthus in this pantheon. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether there are relevant aspects of Malthusian thinking to questions like, you know, can China, a country of, you know, one point whatever billion people and India, a com country of another billion people, become rich in, you know, as though it's abstracted from the entire rest of, of, of the globe and from climate change and, 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 and those mm -hmm. kinds of issues, right? I mean, I think that that, that question of bumping up against limits, yeah. which, you know, kind of lay dormant for a long time, but is there in, in Malthus and maybe coming back to us again? Yeah, um, so I mentioned, I discuss, um, so I probably should have made clear, every chapter I actually discuss quite a lot of other thinkers around the time. So in the earlier chapters, I discuss Malthus and I also discuss uh, French physiocrats. I also discussed John Stuart Mill, James Mill. <laughs> so essentially, it's to get so the so the European Enlightenment, the Scottish Enlightenment that followed it. These ideas around population were very much debated, and in many ways, China was actually um, very Malthusian for a time. The one-child policy was actually intended to prevent population explosion. That. Um, they were um, looking to avoid. So I do cover, um, you know, those things. But in terms of making it sort of the title of one chapter, you just have to make choices about um, how much the economics um, analysis of a particular model has evolved. So, you know, one of the, um, so in other words, not a lot has been done on uh, Malthusian economics. Um, increasingly now, but when you look over 250 years, so that was part of the selection. But you know, you can't fit everyone in. I think that was um, 
what I learned is actually quite a thick book. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not selling the book, am I? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's just one more we could squeeze in. Martin, you, if you've got 30 seconds, I go for it. it. Yeah, if he keeps it quick. Uh, just curious about your uh, interpretation of America, American exceptionalism. Like uh, neuroscience recently said, like America is the product of this big sort. A bunch of people were duped into resettling somewhere else, and um, and that's like America. <laughs> so like you started your talk with the importance of ideas. Do you think America has been successful because Americans were smart and embraced mathematical thinking, or do you think America has been successful because Americans were not? thinking um is there something about that <laughs> like do, do, is, is there something about those i'm tempted to leave it <laughs> do, do you think there's something about the ideas that are embraced because they're not articulated on a conscious level or mm -hmm. is it really this perfect perfect competition of ideas and mm -hmm. the ones you listed are the mm. best um i think the um I think the ideas that I that I list are the ones that have probably gotten the most historical uh, interplay and impact, both in terms of the models being changed and then their application. So I was really looking for things where you could take something like the trade deficit and use that and trace it through the way in which trade theory and models have changed and really tackle one of the issues that's being debated today. So there are going to be lots of issues I don't cover, American exceptionalism, the frontier mentality, the studies which show that America has a smaller welfare state maybe because of the individualism which is inherent in having a country which has a lot of land, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So. Why do we talk about the power issues involved here rather than just talking about this in euphemistic terms? Uh, it's because I'm an economist and I'm not going to go into probably power and things I don't study properly. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the... You know, I don't think I would um, necessarily feel comfortable writing about a book on, um, you know, something which really a lot of excellent people have tackled in terms of, you know, and I just, it's not my, it's not my specialty. I think I'm, you know, I think I'm very insistent that economists should be relevant and cross-disciplinary, but I also don't think you can claim to be an expert in things you haven't properly worked on. And I have been an economist with a law background, which is why I mentioned it my whole career. And I've, you know, I don't think, um, but, and I think we've got something to contribute, but coming from this area and working with others, you know, Mark can solve the power thing, so I don't need to do that. If I'm solving the power thing, we're all in trouble. Thank you very much for coming. Lovely.